Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a beautiful day. And in today's video, I'm gonna be sharing a step-by-step -step tutorial for a watercolor winter landscape. And this one would make for a beautiful Christmas greeting card design. Just as an FYI, I am working on a five by seven inch piece of watercolor paper. And all of the supplies that I use to create this piece will be left down below for you in the description box. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with painting in the sky. I'm gonna be using indigo for my blue and quinacridone lilac for my purple. Since the beginning, I knew that I wanted to create a pretty dark looking sky, like it's later in the afternoon, nighttime almost, uh, because the majority of this painting is gonna have a lot of light values. And so by creating this contrast between very dark area and a very light area, we can create a lot of impact and interest in our piece. And so the two colors that I chose for my sky are indigo, which is a very deep, rich blue, and quinacridone lilac. The quinacridone is gonna help add a little pop of color so that we can not only create a variation in values and translucencies throughout the sky, but also a variation in color. So I prepared two little saturated puddles of color for myself on my paint mixing palette. One of them is plain indigo, and the other is indigo plus some quinacridone lilac. I would highly recommend testing out your quinacridone lilac or whatever kind of purple it is you're using, plus indigo on a scrap piece of watercolor paper, just like I did a moment ago, to make sure that you have a nice difference between your indigo and your blue purple that you're gonna be using. All right, so with my two color mixers already prepared on my color mixing palette, I started using my size 16 round brush to pre-wet the entire sky section. It's very important that your water is nice and clean when you're doing this pre-wetting technique. I am making sure that I arrive at a nice even sheen all throughout. I am maybe going over the entire thing three to four times to ensure that everything is nice and even, nice and uniform, that no puddles are left anywhere, and at the same time, that things don't start drying way too quickly. If you only go over the sky one time in a very quick way, probably, most likely than not, there are some sections that are gonna start drying on you pretty fast, and you're not going to be able to create that nice wet-on-wet -wet effect. I am now dropping in my indigo. I really loaded up my paintbrush with a good amount of paint, and I started dropping it in mostly along the top there. And then I am just bringing out that same color downwards, moving it around just a tiny bit. We don't want flatness. We want to create a nice variation in values and translucencies. Even with just one color here, I'm already thinking of creating some sections that look darker and more saturated, other sections that look kind of a mid midway value and other sections in which the whiteness of the paper is even shining through completely. And that's what you want. That is what's going to bring dimension and interest and even texture into your painting. You want to stay away from flatness. Once I felt I had enough blue in my sky, I am now dropping in my indigo plus quinacridone lilac color mixer into certain areas here and there. And because our paper was pre-wetted with clean water and we're dropping in paint into a section of paper that is wet, that color is dissipating into that wetness. It's helping us arrive at blurred out soft transitions between values and also between colors. Now, as you can see, I am doing some very, very gentle moving around. You can do this while your paint is still wet, but just remember to embrace those organic effects that happen when painting with watercolor and don't start flattening everything out by going over everything again and again and again. For the most part, when working with this medium, the less moving around you do, the better it is and the fresher the outcome is going to turn out. 
right here, I am allowing myself to drop in a little bit more of these two colors into certain sections here and there, because as the paint starts to dry, it's going to start looking a little bit lighter. I am taking advantage of the fact that that first layer of paint is still wet to drop in a little bit more saturated color here and there and add to that variation in values. If you notice that you start dropping in way too much color or you start flattening out your sky, you can go in while that paint is still wet and do some lifting with your absorbent towel. And you can also do some lifting um, with your paintbrush. You can use the bristles of your paintbrush as an absorbent little sponge by just running your bristles very gently along the area where you wanna lift up that color. That's what I'm doing right there. My paintbrush is nice and clean and only slightly damp. I am blotting the bristles of my paintbrush on my absorbent towel and I'm going into my sky to do a little tiny bit of lifting. That creates a very nice illusion of long streaky clouds and having little bits and pieces of highlights in the sky really helps me just create more of a glowy, lighter look. If I start painting in the mountains right now, I can risk that uh, still wet color in the sky bleeding into my mountains. So this is why I am skipping over the mountains and jumping to this bottom section, middle to bottom section of this painting. So I am approaching this by first pre-wetting the section as well in order to have nice blurred out transitions of uh, my blue color turning into that whiteness of the snow. And before getting started with the pre-wetting, which I am using my size 16 round brush for, by the way, I created another variation of this blue plus purple color mixer on my color mixing palette. It's the third color right there at the bottom on my scrap piece of watercolor paper. You can see how it's a nice blue purple that I've created. And this is the color that I'm going to be using to add a little bit of dimension and 3D-ness to the snow ground area. So we know that snow is white, but at the same time, we need to develop somewhat of a variety of values throughout this area because otherwise it's gonna look completely flat. So it's always a balance when you want to add a little bit of a believable sense of 3D form or dimension into an object that is completely white, that you know is white, because you have to arrive at a nice balance between adding enough color to start creating dimension, a variety of values in this area. So you want to reach a balance between developing a certain amount of values throughout this area, very light lights, lighter midtones, etc., but also leaving large areas of white paper completely white, unpainted. Because if we start painting in everything with this blue purple color mixture, we're gonna start making the snow look blue purple instead of white. I am just dropping in a little tiny bit of this blue purple color mixture in little areas, very irregularly, uh, in little areas where I want to develop a little bit of a hill of snow or a sensation of a bump of snow, that's where I'm dropping in this blue-purple. But I don't really have any specific pattern that I am doing. I am keeping everything very irregular, very loose. And once that initial layer of very light translucent blue-purple has been added in and I have a good amount of white paper showing through large sections all throughout this area. I am now allowing myself to drop in a little bit more of the same color in a more saturated state on top of some of these little sections that I've just painted. Notice how I am really avoiding going in with very dark, deep color throughout this snow area. I am still keeping within those lighter midtones. So I'm just finishing up with this snow area right here, and I'm adding in some cast shadow um, where the main trees are going to be in the middle ground and the one in the foreground. 
This way, when I add in the trees, they are going to look like they're actually sitting in the snow because there is a bit of a shadow next to them or around them created by their structure, which is blocking out the light from hitting the floor underneath them. So it's gonna add a certain level of uh, realism into this loose piece. Okay, so we're gonna start painting in the tree line far away from us, close to the mountains. So I created a green color mixer for myself. This is sap green plus a little bit of neutral black, which you can replace with Payne's gray or any sort of black. Um, so I mixed in a little bit of that neutral black into my sap green. I tested it out on my scrap piece of watercolor paper. That's very, very important. And you can see this dark grayish green right there on the left of the screen on my scrap piece of watercolor paper. I switched on over to the smallest paintbrush that I'm going to be using for this piece to paint in these tiny trees in the far away distance. This is a round brush in size one. And I am going in with a semi-translucent version of this dark grayish green, meaning it has quite a bit of water in it and I'm going in kind of translucent. This is very important. You don't wanna go in super deep, super saturated right off the bat because these trees are far away in the distance and by adding them in in a semi-translucent state, we are going to be adding to that believable sensation of open space and depth. Aerial perspective tells us that things farther away from us in the distance are going to appear lighter in value, hazier, meaning less defined, and even cooler in temperature. And this is why I wanna make sure that I'm not going in super dark and saturated right away. I actually want the trees closer to us in the middle ground and the foreground to be darker and more saturated than these trees in the far away distance. Not to mention, we are creating a snowy scene here. And by making sure that many of these trees in the far away distance look very, very light and translucent, we're adding to that illusion of snow falling from the sky and making some of these trees look a little bit wider, a little bit less defined. Notice how I am naturally creating a variation in values as I am moving from tree to tree as that color starts running out from my paintbrush bristles. That is something that happens quite naturally as you're painting with watercolor, and I'm just embracing this natural gradient that is happening as the paint starts running out from my paintbrush bristles. Just a moment ago, you saw me lift up some of that color using my absorbent towel because I noticed that I went in way too saturated. Always help yourself with your absorbent towel. That's what it's there for. It is super, super smart to actually take time to do tree studies, like isolated tree studies of even maybe different types of trees. I always talk on and on about how important it is to break complex compositions apart into things that you can study and practice in isolation. And this is just one of those things. By practicing trees in isolation, you're gonna be able to much more effectively and easily um, add them into actual landscape pieces. All right, so I hope that you can tell how I'm really keeping irregularity in mind. This is super important when you're painting natural organic elements like mountains, like trees, like rocks, anything that is completely natural, you need to have irregularity and imperfection in mind. So as I was adding in these trees, I made sure to add some you know, a little bit taller than others, a little bit wider than others. I made sure that I didn't equally distance them apart, like I was creating any sort of pattern because that would look too organized and too stiff and too mechanic and it would not lead to a natural look. So I kept irregularity in mind at all times as I was adding in these trees in the distance and also as I am adding in these trees in the middle ground and also with the one in the foreground. I added some overlapping trees after having created that initial layer of trees in the far away distance. And you can probably tell that I've added those trees in with a bit of a 
darker value uh, in front, just here and there, making sure that I wasn't creating any, any specific pattern or anything like that. I switched on over to my size six round brush. So I'm getting a little bit bigger for these. Obviously the closer trees are to us, the larger they're going to be. When I'm painting this kind of tree, I personally like working um, from the topmost part of the tree and make my way downwards. The technique that I use for painting these trees is basically a combination between scribbling motions and downwards kind of slanted short strokes. And I am visualizing the layering and the groupings of the leaves for this kind of tree as I am doing all of this. Something that is incredibly helpful, that is always going to be super helpful in you improving your tree paintings is actually informing your work by looking for reference photos, observing trees in real life, and noting their characteristics. Something that is also going to help your trees look a lot more natural is making sure that you're leaving little tiny sections in which you're able to see through the leaves and into the background. Because otherwise, you're just gonna be creating a blob of color or a very blocky, heavy shape. And in real life, you're always able to see through the groupings of leaves and into the background. So essentially, after I've created that initial layer of green in a semi-translucent state, and I'm happy with the overall tree shape and details that I've laid down for the particular tree on hand, I then drop in a little bit of that same color in a more saturated state to further push the darks in certain areas. And for this, it's very helpful to give thought to the particular trees groupings of leaves. Different kinds of trees have different kinds of groupings of leaves, if you notice. And this is important because these groupings of leaves create a sort of mass, if you see it in that way. And that mass is overlapping another grouping of leaves. Um, it creates a cast shadow on that grouping of leaves underneath it, right? So if you at least have um, a vague, a basic understanding of that particular tree's characteristics, you're able at least to loosely place that darker, more saturated green in that area where it would make sense that those groupings of leaves create a cast shadow on each other. And simultaneously, I am making sure to develop a wide variety of values within the tree. It's very easy to start placing way too much saturated green on top of that previous layer of green and start flattening everything out and making everything look way too heavy. Okay, so I am done with the trees in the middle ground. I'm pretty happy with them. And I moved on to start painting the tree closest to us in the foreground. In the beginning, when I start right there at the top of the tree, I am using way more scribbling motions. And as that tree gets larger and larger, as I move downward, I am using more um, longer little slanted strokes. Of course, as well, when I start at the top of that tree, because it's such a small area, I use way more of the tip of my paintbrush and as I move downwards into those larger areas of the tree, I use more of the entirety of the bristles of my paintbrush. But what's important is to shift the way that you're using your paintbrush. In some cases, I'm using just the tip, and in other cases, I'm actually pressing down the, the belly of my brush onto my paper and really shifting just the angle at which you're using your paintbrush as well. That's gonna help you create more organic, irregular shapes as you're painting. If you only use your paintbrush in an upright position, only the tip, on and on and on, and move on in that way, that's not gonna help you create an irregular look to your shapes. It's not gonna look very natural. So keep on shifting the angle at which you're using your paintbrush and also vary the amount of pressure that you're exerting uh, 
um, gently, of course, and how much of your bristles is actually coming into contact with your paper as you're doing all of this. Perfect and controlled is not going to lead to a natural look. And you want to trust those movements of your wrist and your arm as you're laying down these brush strokes. You want to let go a little bit and stay loose so that you can accomplish all of that irregularity. Okay, so for all of these trees in the middle ground and this larger tree in the foreground, I am still using my size six round brush. And you can see how I am constantly dipping my paintbrush into my container of water, removing the excess water and back into my paint and on and on and on, because this is still a pretty small paintbrush. I am running out of paint pretty fast, pretty soon. And I just have to make sure that I am dampening my paintbrush bristles again and grabbing more paint. All right, so I finished painting in that first layer of grayish, darkish green, and I am now allowing myself to go in with a second layer of the same color in a more slightly more saturated state versus, you know, the first more translucent version of this color that we were using before for that first layer which really just means that that first version had a little bit more water in it and this second version has a little bit more paint in it. Um, if you need to add in more of your paint to make your color mixture a little bit more saturated, you can go ahead and do that. Just go ahead and add a little bit more of your green, a little bit more of your neutral, uh, neutral tint or your paint's gray or whatever kind of color it is you're using to darken that green create a little bit more of that paint color. I would recommend whenever it is that you have to make more of your paint color, just test it out on your scrap piece of paper before going in to ensure that it is quite close to the green that you were previously using. Also, having that scrap piece of watercolor paper on hand to constantly test out your color mixtures as well as your transparencies of your colors that you're going into your painting with is super, super helpful because most of the time, at least for this kind of painting, I don't really want a very large discrepancy or a huge step in between my layers of paint. I want that next color that I add in on top of the first layer to be a natural next step. And so by testing out your color mixtures on your scrap piece of watercolor paper, this is going to help you ensure that you're not going in with a super, super dark, um, very, very saturated color on top of color that is very light and translucent. As I am adding in these darker, more saturated green values into some sections of these trees, I am bringing to mind the overlap being created by all of these separate groupings of leaves, these layers of leaves, you know, sitting on top of each other and creating cast shadows on each other. And that's where I'm adding in the darker greens. So the mountains are covered with snow. So just by knowing that, we know that we have to leave a large amount of paper completely unpainted shining through. The very first thing that I did was I created more of my blue-purple color mixture by mixing together indigo and my quinacridone lilac. So similar to the color of the snow that you were using before for the ground. I switched on back to my size 12 round brush and I made sure that my water was nice and clean so that I could do some pre-wetting with clean water. I have added in these little shapes of shadow in these mountains. So basically you're gonna be pre-wetting these shapes or maybe even a little bit past these shapes and you're gonna be dropping in this blue purple color. But it's important to drop it in at the top of the mountain, at the top of that shape there. You can also see right here, after I've started adding in this blue purple, that I've left a little sliver of the edge, the top edge of that mountain, completely dry when I was doing that pre-wetting because I wanted to keep that whiteness of the paper as a highlight. It helps me create an illusion of light. All right, so after having dropped in this blue purple in its most saturated state, at the very top of that shape of that mountain, or the shadow shape of that mountain, you're then going to remove all of the color from your paintbrush bristles. You're gonna remove the excess water of your paintbrush bristles, and then you're gonna go back in with a clean and slightly dampened paintbrush, and you're gonna gently start bringing that color down. 
This is gonna help you create a natural gradient going from more saturated color to more translucent, lighter color as you go downwards. It's important to remember though, the less moving around of paint you do, the better. Okay, so just bring it down gently. Make sure that you're not going back and forth in the entire area because that is likely to flatten everything out and leave that paint be. Also remember that when your paper is already wet or you have a previous layer of paint that is already settling into your paper starting to dry, you don't want to go in with a ton of water in your paintbrush bristles. You want to make sure that you have removed all of the excess water from your paintbrush bristles because otherwise you can start creating splotchiness or back runs. I am constantly staying on top of water control by always gently scraping my paintbrush bristles alongside the top of my container of water when I go into my water. Um, and I'm also constantly removing excess paint and excess water using my absorbent towel. Okay, so the second step to do after you have painted in that initial layer of blue purple in those mountains and you have succeeded at creating that gradient from darker and more saturated blue purple at the top to lighter and more translucent blue purple going downwards, all you have to do is just place a little tiny bit of cerulean blue somewhere along the central part of that shape. This pop of lighter, brighter blue is gonna help add a little bit of interest into these blue-purple areas. And because that blue-purple layer was still wet, the cerulean blue very gently dissipates and bleeds into that wetness. Right here, I am going to be adding in one more shadow section that I hadn't sketched in initially in my outline sketch. So I did the exact same thing. I first pre-wetted this very irregular abstract shape with clean water. I then dropped in the blue purple at the top of that shape, allowed it to bleed a little bit, removed all of the color from my paintbrush bristles. The excess water as well is removed. And then I went back in to do a very gentle moving around, bring this paint color down. And then I just added in a little tiny pop of cerulean blue after I was happy with that blue purple. Okay, so once I was done painting those sections, I removed all of the cerulean blue from my bristles of my paintbrush. And I am going in with a super, super light and translucent version of the blue purple that I had previously prepared for myself. This is so translucent, you can barely see it. If there's any doubt in your mind that you're maybe not going in with a super translucent version of your color, test it out on your scrap piece of watercolor paper before going into your painting. And the reason why I am starting to add in these very translucent light shapes is because that uh, large white area of these mountains creates a lot of flatness and once again going back to painting white subjects or objects. If you have very large white areas and there is no amount of variation in values developed in them, um, at least, you know, minimally with very light values, most likely than not, they're gonna lead to a lot of flatness. And I'm just going in with very irregular organic shapes and making sure to leave a lot of white space just completely unpainted so that these mountains can still look like they are covered in white snow. And right here, I'm getting started with the white gouache. So I am using my size six round brush for this. And just a moment ago, you saw me actually prepare a little bit of gouache in the separate color mixing palette that I like using for my gouache. I don't actually like mixing my gouache on my watercolor palette because gouache is very opaque and it tends to matte out and make my colors chalky. And I wanna keep my colors that I use for my painting process nice and vibrant. I squeezed a little bit of that white gouache onto this gouache palette that I have here. And I added a little bit of water into it because it's very thick. The thickness, the consistency of your gouache is really going to vary from brand to brand. Um, and most likely than not, you're gonna have to play around with that consistency before actually using it on your watercolor painting. And what I mean by this is you're gonna have to play with the water to gouache ratios. Bring a little tiny bit of water into your gouache, swivel your paintbrush bristles, 
to mix that water into your gouache and then try to test it on top of that green or wherever you're going to be placing it on your paper to see how translucent it looks. Most likely than not, because you're painting in snow, you want it to look pretty white. You don't want it very translucent. And so you're going to have to play around with those ratios until it's just right for you. Just know that it really varies from brand to brand and from gouache to gouache. So again, if you want to test it out on top of one of those shapes that you've painted in on your extra sheet of watercolor paper where you've been testing out your color mixtures to notice that translucency. Uh, with gouache though, you don't want to go in with very, very thick blobs of paint. If you lay down gouache in very thick layers when it dries, it's going to start cracking. So yes, you want to lay it down in such a way that it looks white, but you don't want to lay it down so thickly that when it dries, it's going to start cracking. Okay, so I'm really, really making sure not to go overboard, taking it a step at a time and just stepping back from my piece and noticing if more gouache is really necessary to transmit that illusion of snow on these trees. If you go overboard, you're gonna start covering up that beautiful variation and green values that you've developed and that's really not the point. And I'm really using brush strokes that are quite similar to the brush strokes that I was using when I was painting in the green of those trees scribbles, pressing down my, my bristles of my paintbrush in different ways to create those very irregular abstract little shapes, and sometimes doing those short slanted strokes in the direction of the growth of those leaves of those trees. Irregularity is really key. For this very last step, we're going to be doing our splattering with a white gouache. And once again, we don't want to go overboard with this. So I've added a little bit more water into my white gouache onto my separate color mixing palette right there. You definitely want to bring in a, a good amount of water into your gouache mix so that it actually splatters on because otherwise you're just going to be splattering blobs of thick paint on your painting. But you don't want it so watery that it looks very translucent and not white anymore. For this, I switched on over to my old beat up size eight round brush. I recommend using a paintbrush that is kind of medium sized, definitely not too small because you're not gonna be able to load it up with a good amount of gouache to do that splattering and definitely not too big that you start losing control. Test out your gouache if you have to on a scrap piece of watercolor paper before going in. And if you turn this video back just a minute or two, you're gonna notice that I use very slight, very gentle tapping motions in kind of a cross or X position using a second brush under that gouache brush and do that very gentle tapping, making sure not to go overboard with the amount of splattering. I don't want to overwhelm the viewer with white gouache. All right, everybody, we are done with this tutorial. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and if you did, this tutorial was created alongside two other Christmas inspired watercolor card designs, all of which I shared over on Patreon last week. So if you'd like to check out the other ones along with the library of over 50 real time, fully narrated tutorials with downloadable outline sketches, supply lists and reference photos, and much more exclusive content that I don't share anywhere else, make sure to check out my membership site over on Patreon, which you can join for a very small amount a month. The link to my site will be left down below for you in the description box in case you'd like to go and check it out. I also share sketchbook challenges, which go out every single week and help you stay consistent, a library of classes on art fundamentals that gets added to each and every month. There are live art chats and Q and A's with me every month, and there are a variety of different tiers that you can join according to your needs. All right, everyone, that is going to do it for today's video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, that you learned something new or that you found it inspiring. If you did like it, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and allows more artists to get to know about my channel. Thank you so very much for watching today. I really, really appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments for me, make sure to leave them down below in the comment section. I always love hearing from you guys and read every single one of your comments. Don't forget to subscribe so that I can see you next week for another video and stay inspired. Bye guys.